Next up, uh, we have the plenary number four, uh, which will be uh, on work-life balance, and the session will be chaired by Professor Srinath Chandrasekhar. He's a senior professor in surgery and a uh, consultant urological surgeon uh, at the University of uh, Sri Jawadhanipura, uh, Sri Lanka. What do you say? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have. Uh... It's my greatest pleasure to introduce the next plenary uh, speaker uh, for this morning. Uh, he's none other than Professor Andrew Hill, uh, who's a renowned personality in the surgical fraternity. Uh, he's authored over 300 peer-reviewed publications in his uh, chosen field in uh, journals across the world, and has won many pre prestigious local as well as international awards. Uh, he's also a member of several editorial boards in his own home country, which is New Zealand uh, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, Professor Hill uh, is the immediate past president of the International Society of Surgery. Uh, it's, my, I, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Hill uh, to deliver his uh, plenary on work-life balance. Over to you, Prof. Greetings to everybody uh, from Auckland, New Zealand. It's a uh, beautiful sunny afternoon here and I look back a couple of years to when I was last with you and I was uh, given um, an honorary uh, fellowship of your of the College of Surgeons, um, which I count as a great honour. Um, I'm no particular expert on work-life balance and uh, every time my wife hears that I'm going to be talking about this, she laughs. But I am a practicing surgeon like you and I've learned a few lessons and I'd like to share them with you. Uh, I have no uh, relevant financial uh, relationships. Uh, some of you will remember this movie if, from a few years ago uh, by Mel Gibson, where he talks about the fact, one of the lines in the movie, which I've always liked, is all men die, few men truly live. And I think as we go through this talk, it's worthwhile just uh, thinking through uh, what that might mean in our lives. Uh, Jack Welch, a famous American businessman, uh, when he talked about work-life balance, he said there's no such thing as work-life balance. There are work-life choices and you make them and they have consequences. And I think that's a very important uh, concept as we uh, go on through this topic. As we try to balance things up, there's the things that we have going on in our lives as family, there's a career, there's a friends, there's a health, and you may be able to add in some other things that are important in your life. And all those add up to what we would call life, um, life balance. If you get it wrong, uh, lots of bad things can happen. It can start with uh, anxiety, not being able to sleep at night, uh, panic attacks, uh, depression. These are all the signs and endpoints of burnout and depression. And these are the things that just affect us. Obviously, they also affect our families. But it also matters because it's, it leads to problems with patient safety. And a lot of data now, they're now saying that a stressed, burned out doctor is not a particularly good doctor and has uh, complications. And in surgery, we really can't afford to do that because the sorts of things that we do uh, can create enormous problems. These are some of the other consequences of physician stress and burnout. There's the professional ones making poor judgments, uh, medical errors, patient events, uh, adverse patient events, uh, difficult relations, co-workers -work and disengagement. And from a personal point of view, and I've talked about these, um, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance, broken relationships, alcohol and drug addictions, marital dysfunction, and divorce, early retirement and suicide. And as doctors and as surgeons especially, and our anesthetic colleagues, suicide is a very big problem. I've always said that, um, and I suspect it's the same in Sri Lanka, that all of us know somebody in our class from medical school who went to suicide or tried to. And that's a terrible indictment on us as a profession. And it's even worse than surgery and, in, as I said, in anesthesia. Burnout may well be an opportunity for personal growth, uh, but it's best avoided. Uh, this is a thing that I like to think about, and that is. Stress, uh, there's a, whoops, sorry. Uh, with stress, there's a, there's a certain amount of stress that we need to have in our lives to enable us to um, perform at our very best. 
And as stress rises to a point, our performance increases. And there's a zone that you might call your comfort zone. It's a zone in many cases where we're operating, we're doing really well. Uh, people talk about something called flow. Uh, it's where things are just going well. It's where you don't even notice the time. There's a sort of a zone that works really well. Then if you go a little bit too far, then you get to fatigue and performance starts to fall off if the stress increases. If you use stress management techniques, and we'll talk a little bit about those, then you can make that point a little bit uh, um, higher and a little bit uh, later in, in, the, in the piece, but it doesn't go away. And I also make one other point that the stress that leads you to go over the edge is not the actual problem necessarily. It's all the other things you had on that got you to that point. As we say in, in um, Western culture, I don't know if you say it in your place, it's the, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. So there are a number of things that you can do. Obviously looking after yourself is something we don't talk much about as surgeons, but eating well, sleeping well, exercising well, loving our families, loving ourselves, learning the difference between reflection and rumination. I think that's a really important one. Reflection is where you look back on something that happened or look back on uh, something going on in your lives and uh, reflect on it and learn from it. Whereas rumination is where you think about it all night. What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? Oh, I could do this better next time and so on and so forth. And then there's the whole concept of mindfulness, which I think in the Buddhist culture, that effect, that's a part, very much a part of large amounts of Sri Lanka is somewhere where you're way ahead of us in the West. Um, the idea of meditation and mindfulness, learning to just be, is a very important concept that we've learned from you over the last, I would say, 20 years or so. Uh, this is New Zealand. We're very proud of our sailing traditions. Uh, we're about to have the America's Cup, which is a very big yacht race here in New Zealand earlier next year. Uh, and uh, I've often noticed, as many of you would have watched, watch yachts or boats, uh, sailing boats, um, is that the way some, some boats are going with the wind and some boats are going against the wind. And yet they're all managing to use the same wind. The winds of circumstances blow on us all in an unending flow that touches on each of our lives and what guides us and how we get to different destinations very much determined by the way we set our sails. It's the way that each of us thinks that makes the major differences in where we arrive. And the major difference is the set of the sail. And I think this is an extremely important concept. The concept of mindfulness, which again, I'm probably talking to you about something you already know a lot about, but that whole idea that we're busy watching out for, we're so busy watching out for what's just ahead of us that we don't take time to enjoy where we are. And I think as busy surgeons, uh, especially as academics, we can see from this, this little picture up at the top right where somebody has been focusing very much on their publications and how they've had an enormous number of publications, but have they really sat back and analyzed what they're doing? So mindfulness, if you hadn't thought about before, is the practice of paying attention to thoughts, physical sensations and the environment, that constantly feeling the need to judge what's happening or to make it other than it is. So you can live in the past, or you can live in the future. But in reality, all we do is live in the present. We can spend a lot of time ruminating about the past. We can spend a lot of time worrying about the future. But one's gone and one's to come. And all we are doing really is living in the present. And that's an important place to be and an important place to realize we are in. Now, <clears throat> I don't normally tell people about articles I've written, but here's a couple that I think it might be worth writing down. Both of them are articles that I really provided the surgeon's, surgeon's side to it, and not that I'm any sort of expert on it. But the first one I wrote with a guy called Tony Fernando and Nathan Considine from the University of Auckland. We talk about mindfulness for surgeons, and that's in the ANZ Journal of Surgery from 2014. And it's that idea of um, an alternate state of mind, a way of being the typical stressed and untrained state that predisposes us to unwellness. Um, it's not really a religious thing, although for some people um, it is, um, and has a large amount of data um, supporting its value nowadays. And the other paper, which is not actually to do with mindfulness per se, or it does mention, and that is talking about building resilience 
in the face of the first adversity. And I wrote that with Ruth Robertson, my cousin, and that's just been published in the ANZ Journal of Surgery. And STRONG uh, stands for a number of things to help us to um, work towards building resilience. And I think you'll find that paper helpful. We put a lot of time into that and I'm really quite proud of it. And I think you'll find it useful. <clears throat> in the Christian Bible, um, in the book of Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. This idea of being content is a very important thing that we need to be thinking about. We need to know ourselves, what makes us tick, what are the things that get us going, what are the things that make us um, that make us um, angry, what are the things that make us happy, how do, we, how do we cope with these things. And one of the things we talk about in the paper with Ruth is that focusing on your weaknesses all the time may not actually be the best way to do things. As surgeons, we're always trying to make ourselves better and we're always trying to focus on our weaknesses and make ourselves better, but it may in fact be that you need to focus on your strengths. I think that's a, a line that I've often used and it's often said, there's no one on their deathbed wishes they'd spent more time in the office or in the operating room. It's really who's going to be around you, around you, um, around you when you, when you die, um, when you get to the end of your life and you're looking back on it. Uh, somebody, a, a, a paraphernalia surgeon said, um, he says, sleep well, take the stairs and don't mess with the pancreas. I'm a colorectal surgeon, so my line is that everyone should be given a stoma. Um, in other words, um, you know, sleep well, get your exercise in, and just don't mess around with things you don't need to mess around with. And as a colorectal surgeon, you know, if you think somebody could do with their anastomosis being defunctioned, you'll sleep better than do it. And I think the other thing is that you need to define the level of life that you want to live at, and you need to live there. That whole point about being content. Now, this is a um, this is a castle in northern Florida in the United States, and it had several attacks by um, other military and yet never suffered defeat. Now, you can see it's got very thick walls, but these walls are made of something quite interesting. They're made of, by the, of this stuff called Kikina. And Kikina is made of seashells, and it takes three years to prepare. And what it does is absorbs hits rather than shatters. So a cannonball hits it, the Kikina soaks it in, and the cannibal bounce off, bounces off. And I think this is a really good way to think about how we handle stress, how we handle difficult times. We should think about being like Kikina. If we, if we try to be too brittle, we try to be too rigid, then we'll find that one of these days we'll break. Whereas if we're like Kikina, we'll find that we can just take the hits again and again as they bounce off us. This is a Japanese concept, the concept of Kinsu, Kurai, Kurai. And this is about the art of repairing with gold, um, repairing pottery with gold or silver lacquer. As you can see, the, the, the pot um, or the piece of um, ceramic has obviously been broken and shattered. And yet, it's been put back together and arguably, in fact, in my mind and many others, it's far more beautiful for having been broken. So for those of us who do end up having trouble where we actually end up do having a breakdown or we end up getting depressed, we may well find actually it's something that's really good for us or we can make something very good out of it. Um, the idea of making good out of bad things or bad times is an important concept to have. Do you need some help? Um, well, look, many of, us, uh, uh, many of us who are in the room today will actually recognize some of the things I've talked about and may in fact be very stressed. Um, especially in these difficult times, I understand that COVID, while being fairly gentle on Sri Lanka in, in the recent past, has actually started to hit you a bit harder. And I know that's stressful and difficult. And uh, it is for all of us. And some of you will have found this last year extraordinarily difficult. So accepting that you need some help is often the hardest part, but it's an important thing to do. Generally, you're not mad. Um, many people have gone through these sorts of problems and you're, you're generally not mad. It's unlikely that you'll need electricity or be put in a padded cell, you might need some pills, um, but it may be temporary or in fact, it's not, it may not be a big deal. You'd be surprised at who else has had trouble. Um, just asking around a bit, you might find that there's plenty of other people who've had trouble. I remember talking to my father who was a surgeon, asked him if he'd ever seen anybody with burnout. He said, no, nah, no, nah, it didn't happen in his day. Then I asked him why the cardiac surgeon lived down the street um, 
was found what you see him running at two o'clock in the morning or well, one of the other cardiac surgeons was a was a very heavy smoker they plainly have found life a bit stressful the general practitioners a lot more than they let on um those guys at med school they perhaps thought well the ones who couldn't get on surgery actually know quite a lot about this stuff and as i said at the beginning it may well be a wonderful opportunity for personal growth though, the japanese idea of the pottery that's made better through being broken and repaired most people I know have burned out regard as a life changer. So being a doctor is hard. Let's be kind to each other in the words of the Prime Minister of New Zealand over these difficult times. We all go through the same stuff, but we go through it differently. I want to tell you a little story. So a professor stood before his philosophy class <clears throat> and had some items in front of him. When the class began, Wordlessly, he picked up a very large and empty mayonnaise jar and proceeded to fill it with golf balls. He then asked the students if the jar was full. They agreed that it was. The professor then picked up a box of pebbles and poured them into the jar. He shook the jar lightly. The pebbles rolled into the open area between the golf balls. He then asked the students again if the jar was full. They agreed it was. <clears throat> the professor next picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. Of course, the sand filled up everything else. He asked what's more if the jar was full. The students responded with a unanimous yes. The professor then produced two cups of coffee from under the table and poured the entire contents into the jar, effectively filling the empty space between the sand. The students laughed. Now said the professor, as the laughter subsided, <clears throat> I want you to recognize that this jar represents your life. The golf balls are the important things, God, family, children, health, friends, favorite passions, things and everything else was lost and only they remained, your life would be full. The pebbles are the other things that matter, like your house, job, car, and so on. The sand is everything else, the small stuff. When you put the sand into the jar first, he continued, there's no room for the pebbles or the golf balls. The same goes for life. If you spend all your time and energy on the small stuff, you'll never have room for the things that are important to you. Pay attention to the things that are critical to your happiness. Play with your children, Take time to get medical checkups, take your partner out to dinner. There'll always be time to clean the house and fix the disposal. Take care of the golf balls first, the things that really matter. Set your priorities, the rest is just sand. One of the students raised her hand and inquired what the coffee represented. The professor smiled, I'm glad you asked. Just goes to show that no matter how full your life may seem, there's always room for a couple of, co cup of, couple of cups of coffee with a friend. Many blessings to you all on Sri Lanka um, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you Professor uh, Hill for that very enlightening lecture and we look forward to meeting you in Sri Lanka or in Auckland very soon. Good day. <laughs>